good morning, committee, and welcome guests. Today we're going to take up um, Senate Bill 358, but first we'll open up for any bill introductions for today. Anybody have any bill introductions? Seeing none, we'll move on. We'll um, open up the hearing on Senate Bill 358 officially, and we will begin with the reviser. Welcome to the committee, Tamara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, committee. Senate Bill 358 would amend the definition of project in the Public Water Supply Project Loan Program, and this would allow financing for public water supply infrastructure projects that acquire water through a water transfer. The Public Water Supply Loan Fund is used to provide loans to municipalities and water districts to replace drinking water infrastructure systems. Currently, the definition of project excludes any project related to the diversion or transportation of water acquired through a water transfer. Senate Bill 358 would strike that exclusion, which would allow monies from the Public Water Supply Loan Fund to be used to finance public water supply system projects related to a water transfer. The bill would take effect upon publication in the statute book, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Committee, any questions for the reviser? Uh, Senator Reichman. Uh, thank you. Uh, are we talking about, uh, we're talking about this would help provide loans for them to do this, or, or is the state giving any money directly or anything like that? So there is a fund in statute that does provide loans to municipalities and water districts for certain water projects. And right now, the definition of project excludes projects related to water transfers. So by removing that exclusion, those funds would be allowed to be used for water transfer projects. Thank you. I thought that's what you're saying. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Any other questions for the reviser? Seeing none, thank you very much, Tamara. <clears throat> we'll move into the proponent testimony, and we'll start with uh, Toby Daughtery, City Manager, Hayes, Kansas. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Daughtery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Toby Doherty. I'm the city manager of Hayes, Kansas. And uh, as the reviser stated, um, we are asking support for this bill um, due to the fact that Hayes and Russell own a property jointly in Edwards County that they are developing as a water supply, a public water supply. Um, this property will um, provide a long-term sustainable source of water to an economy um, that has a $2 billion economic output. It'll be a, a regional water supply. Um, this project will be required to follow the terms of the Water Transfer Act as outlined in, in Kansas statute. So currently, um, the way the, the statutes are written, we would be prohibited from considering the Public Water Supply Loan Fund for financing. Uh, this could increase project costs significantly depending on interest rates at the time, which would lead to um, higher rates for uh, Hayes and Russell and regional water customers uh, unnecessarily if we don't have access to the, to the loan fund. Um, another component of, of the reason why we're asking this is it's our understanding that the uh, um, dollars earmarked for Kansas water supply projects with the recently adopted federal infrastructure bill will be distributed via the public water supply loan fund. Um, and therefore, Hayes and Russell would be prohibited from seeking uh, those dollars in any uh, component associated with this project. Um, Senate Bill 358 does not modify the Water Transfer Act in any way. Uh, Hayes and Russell still have to follow those, those statutes uh, to fully um, and, and be vetted through that process before any sort of project would be authorized. Uh, this only deals with the potential financing of, of the project. And I would like to um, um, point out that this was called for in Governor Brownback's 50-year water vision, the removal of this restriction on um, transfer projects being prohibited from receiving water supply fund dollars. And with that, I would stand for any questions the committee may have. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to questions. Uh, Senator Reichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. If I'm understanding what you're saying, if we did pass this, it's, 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 a, it's a possibility you could help get some federal money from the infrastructure fund. Correct. Uh, on, on two different ways. Uh, the state of Kansas has uh, the, the public water supply loan fund that they, they loan out at very low interest rates. Um, so it's not a grant, it's a loan um, at very low interest rates. Um, it, 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 
as it's been the last few years, interest rates overall are very low, so um, it may or may not be competitive, but down the road, we don't know what that's going to bring. And then the federal infrastructure dollars, those may come down in the form of grants, um, but we have been told that those dollars will be funneled through the Public Water Supply Loan Fund because that is the phone KD, fund KDHE has to distribute dollars like that. Um, so we would be prohibited from seeking any of those grant monies. I think, may I follow up? Uh, also, you mentioned Russell and Hayes. Uh, is there any, uh, what's the feedback from Russell? Um, Russell is a partner in this project. Um, so the city of Hayes bought um, a property in Edwards County in 1995. It bought it on the open market and, and the associated water rights with it. Um, and a year later, Russell, the city of Russell purchased an 18% stake. And we have been a partner ever since in developing this as a long-term water supply. Um, so Russell is fully supportive of this. Uh, I believe you have testimony submitted from the mayor and city manager. And, and I would like to point out the, that they regret they can't be here. They have had organizational challenges due to COVID, which prohibited them from being out of the office. Um, we do have uh, letters of support for the project from the cities of Victoria, Ellis, Ellis County. Um, this is truly being viewed as a regional water supply. We are really the only um, metro area in Kansas that doesn't have adequately available local water supplies. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just curious as to what have the water levels in the wells that supply Hayes done over the years? Have they fluctuated quite a bit, or have they stayed um, fairly level and, and low? They do fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, we have two main sources, uh, Big Creek. Uh, we have wells in the alluvial along Big Creek, which flows through Hayes. And then we have a well field on the, on the Smoky Hill River uh, south of town, about 10 miles. And Russell actually has this roughly the same setup. Um, so our wells respond uh, very quickly to um, whatever the trend is uh, from, a, from a meteorological standpoint. Um, so we've had a few good wet years and our well levels have been great. Um, the problem is when you go back to, like say the drought of 2011 through 14, um, we are mining water out of our sources and so uh, the city of Hayes consumes about 2,000 acre feet of, of water annually. Um, during the height of the drought, we were consuming 2,000 acre feet, but mining at least 1,000 acre feet out of our sources, uh, which is not sustainable because they're relatively shallow alluvial sources. Um, so th that is the reason why the, um, the R9 is appealing to us as a long-term supply because it is sustainable. Um, it is a renewable source that, that, um, that year after year after year can produce uh, a sustainable amount of water. Thank you. It's, it's something what I suspected. I remember in a presentation in front of a, an extension council years ago, uh, someone had told us that Kansas has about an eight-year drought pattern. And I have seen this in so many different areas in my district, which the R9 Ranch is in my district in Edwards County. So um, it's good to hear that those levels do come back up when, uh, when the rainfall is plentiful. So thank you. Thank you. Questions, committee? Senator Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Toby, I don't know if this is a question for you. I'm just curious, who, where does the money come from for this project loan program? I would defer to Mr. Stiles, who I believe is in the audience. Senator Tom Stiles, Bureau of Water at KDHE. It comes from a Blend, we get capitalization grants from EPA on an annual basis as appropriated by Congress. And then we typically will leverage that by through uh, Kansas uh, Development Finance Authority to issue revenue bonds to basically build that up. And then it, as it, by its nature, it's a revolving loan fund. So loans go out, come back with interest and fees, and those interest and fees then feed into the next subsequent set of loans that go out with projects. So none of it comes from the general fund? No, it is okay. uh, separate from the general fund totally. I have a question for Mr. Bernardi. You outlined your policy, what the policy is when you get to wells in that position where you, there, you might be low. Is there something that kicks in, rationing or conservation? What is the policy on that? Um, so Hayes is somewhat unique, um, if I may. Uh, there are 35 Kansas counties with a population of more than 15,000. 
and, and 34 of those counties either lie along or east of Highway 81, uh, Salina to Wichita, or they overlay a major aquifer. So think Hutchison, Dodge City, Garden City, um, Liberal. Um, Ellis County is the only one that's unique. Uh, we do not have a major aquifer that we overlie, and, and we are too far west for reliable stream flow. Um, so Hayes has been practicing water conservation since the early 90s. Um, there was a drought in, I believe, 1991 um, that, that required change, Hayes to change its course. They invested heavily in conservation measures at the time. Um, the unique thing about Hayes is we practice those conservation measures during wet years and dry years. Uh, we never take our foot off the gas. So our regulations never change. Our, 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 our outdoor watering requirements never change. The money we spend on incentives never changes, um, regardless of how wet or how dry it is. So when you look at the statewide average for water uh, usage, um, it's about 140 gallons per person per day. When you look at the region that Hayes and Russell are in, it's about 170 gallons. Um, Hayes uses around 90 gallons per capita per day. Um, our issue is um, we have, the way I like to state it is we've, we've reached the effective limits of conservation. We've had to search, search uh, uh, best practices in Arizona, California, Nevada, um, the desert southwest um, and copy those practices, but the reality is we're the only city in Kansas that's doing that, and Russell as well. Um, we're really the only cities that are doing that, which, which really makes us an outlier, and, and we feel it could harm us economically um, if we do it. So um, you, you don't see a lot of uh, variation in our water usage between wet years and dry years. We stay very, very much uh, the same. Any other questions? Senator Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. Um, I um, know that Hayes has a long and well-deserved reputation for water conservation, so that's appreciated. We've um, been hearing about that um, over the years. So what, um, can you tell me how far this diversion is? Because I'm assuming it's outside the 35-mile radius, which makes it a water transfer. How far is this water being transferred? The transfer is 67 miles uh, from the well field that will be developed on the property we own to the, uh, the terminus in the Smoky Hill River Basin where it will, it will supply then Hayes and Russell. And so, yes, we, Senator, we will have to follow the, the Water Transfer Act as outlined in statute because that is 35 miles and, and 2,000 acre feet. Um, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't at all change the Water Transfer Act. It would just make these public... Um, funds available for loans. Yes. Um, yeah, actually, this change only benefits us presuming that we navigate the Transfer Act um, and we're seeking funding to actually construct the project. Um, so, no, it does not affect the water transfer statutes at all. Thank you. Um, I know that there were, and you might help remind the committee about those, I know that there have been concerns about water transfers um, across the state, and we, um, I think at the same time that we want to make sure that Hayes is being helped, we also want to make sure we don't open up um, some other longer um, than 67-mile transfers. Well, it, it's understandable. Um, you know, as we've looked to the West for our water conservation practices, when you look to the West, you can see some bad examples of, of water transfers um, that have been harmful to different areas to benefit one area. Um, the unique part about this transfer is, one, the property. The property is sustainable um, with, with how we're going to, to manage it. Um, and that's something that we agreed to during the process um, with Division of Water Resources to convert the water rights from irrigation to municipal. Um, so there's no state law that requires you to be um, sustainable with your water rights. Typically, the water right itself will, will dictate that. Um, but, uh, but there's no state law that, that does this. So the chief engineer at the time, as we were converting the water rights, asked us to commit to sustainability. Um, and, and so we voluntarily uh, agreed to reduce our water rights by 30% in order to make sure we were being sustainable with our, with our property. That is the sustainable number of, of, the, of, the, of the property, so we do not harm adjacent property owners, um, water right holders, we, we, we hold them harmless in this process. Um, so um, a allowing a transfer like this um, would not have any, any harm from a water perspective, but only benefit then from an economic perspective for a region. 
And that's what we're going to have to demonstrate during the water transfer process is that, that there would be no economic harm. Thank you. And that is because of an agreement you've made, not because of any other state requirements. Um, the, the, yes, it's, this is um, um, an agreement we made in order to, so that the, the chief engineer has to um, allow the conversion of the water rights. Right now, the, the, the water rights are, are, are irrigation water rights, and we have a quantity that we can pump annually. We have places where we can pull it out of the ground, and then we have a rate at which we can pull it out of the ground. And so that's the process that we had to change in order to convert this to municipal well field. Um, and that's where the chief engineer wanted to um, ask us to impose our uh, sustainable yield on ourselves. Um, I can tell you our attorney's answer was, no, you can't make us do that. Uh, it's not in state law. But the reality is we have no desire to use the property in an unsustainable manner. Um, Hayes and Russell have water rights um, locally in excess of our need, but we don't have water. Uh, you guys have probably heard the term paper water rights, um, meaning you have a right to something, but the water's not there. Well, we have that. Water, water rights were developed at a time when um, maybe they were a little ambitious with, their, with the, the granting of them. So um, if we actually had the water locally to the rights we had, I wouldn't be in front of <laughs> this committee or considering a 67-mile pipeline. So we have no intention of using the R9 in an unsustainable manner, so that's why we agreed to sustainable yield. If I may, would you have any um, concern if... Um, this might, would be amended to say project only includes um, uh, projects related to the diversion of transportation water um, if those um, meet sustainable standards established by the chief engineer. I would have no problem with that. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? I might ask, what's the longest water transfer distance out there now? I believe Water One has a pipeline north um, on the Missouri River uh, that feeds down into Johnson County, which I believe is in excess of 35 miles. No. Okay. Yes, my, my apologies. Uh, it, it it went under the original Transfer Act, but it uh, it hasn't. No, but nobody's tested the, the modified Transfer Act. So, according to Thomas, 10 miles. I mean, this would be the largest one ever listed. Then. Correct. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we ask for John Quindy, City Manager of Russell. Oh. Um. Committee, I'll draw your attention to the next is a proponent testament that was written only. Sarah. <coughs> That's from Sarah Chenoweth from Kansas League of Municipality. Representative Wassinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm sorry, I ha I'm, having been a Hayes City Commissioner in my district is Hayes, I have a genuine interest in this. And I wanted to give you some information beyond the acre feet and the miles. As Toby told you, we, we use less water in the city of Hayes per capita now than we did in 1983. That's pretty amazing. There is not a person in Hayes that does not know that you need to be saving water. The city provides low flow shower heads, efficient, efficiency washers. You can get rebates for those. You get rebates for your low flow toilets. And they're the only state, the only municipality in the state that pays for you to redo your lawn and go to low water use grass, take out the fescue, put in buffalo. They're also the first city in the state that hired a water conservation specialist. They're, that's how serious they are about using our natural resources in a wise way and being good stewards. Uh, I just really urge you to go ahead and help us get this changed because the people that will suffer if we don't are the citizens of Hayes and Russell who will have to foot, help foot the, ball, the bill. Pardon me. So thank you very much, and I'll stand for questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions for Representative Wassinger? Seeing none, thank you very much. <clears throat> 
I don't have any more. Is there anybody else that wants to testify as a proponent? Seeing none, we'll move. Is there any opponent's testimony? Anybody? We don't have any listed. I just want to ask if there is any. <clears throat> Next one, we'll ask if there's any neutral testimony for today. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Stiles. Uh, thank you, Chairman Kirshen and Senators. I'm, again, Tom Stiles. I'm the Director of Bureau of Water for Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Uh, the agency is neutral on the, on the, on the bill. It, the bill represents, essentially, legislative policy. And whether it passes or uh, remains in committee, really will not impact KDHE operations one way or the other. It is just a matter of a policy of how water transfers potentially can utilize the SRF fund. Uh, let me give you a little history uh, that plays into it and then the mechanisms that are in place right now to that basically provide appro appropriate safeguards that uh, generally create a, a favorable stance toward, toward the bill. We've only had one water transfer in the state, and that was so 91-92 when Johnson County went to the Missouri River to uh, divert water there. Uh, and that fell under the original version of the Water Transfer Act as found in KSA 82-1501 at SEEK. That proceeding was an administratively procedural debacle. And uh, in the aftermath, both the Kansas Water Office and the Kansas Water Authority came forth with a proposal to overhaul the Water Transfer Act and how it's, you know, how it's utilized. That occurred in 1993, and it was a long and contentious debate within the legislature over the policies surrounding water transfers and, and wound up redefining what water transfers were to where it was moving water more than uh, 2,000 acre feet, more than 35 miles. Um, and then it's laid dormant. In 1994, the Public Water Supply Loan Fund was created uh, in uh, response to the creation of the federal uh, state revolving phone uh, through the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, the legislator created the what we would call the Drinking Water SRF uh, to utilize those federal monies, again, as I described to the senator, uh, as well as then leveraging with uh, revenue bonds through, through KDFA and use that to support infrastructure investments on the part of public water supplies, whether they be municipalities, rural water, uh, public wholesale water districts. The legislature in creating the fund in 94 also set up the policy that said water transfer, projects involving water transfers can't use this. It was basically viewed as a means to remove any financial incentive to encourage a lot of water transfers, which the legislature was very, very wary about. And it's laid dormant ever since. Uh, no one is, uh, has, we have not triggered a water transfer uh, in the subsequent almost 30, 30 years. When Governor Brownback rolled out the 50 year vision for the long term water supply for, for Kansas under alternative supplies, uh, this issue rose again. And a recommendation came forth through that process that uh, was essentially, as it reads now, eliminate statutory prohibition to use the drinking water SRF funds for water transfers, as well as identify other state policies which unnecessarily limit transfers. It was viewed as an impediment to the planning of our uh, public water supplies, particularly our municipalities, to basically project out long-term uh, needs and meeting those needs in, in the future uh, through uh, by whatever mechanisms are necessary to do that. Now, a transfer occurs uh, as a result of either a uh, uh, acquisition of water rights or development of new water rights through division of water resources or obtaining water through a water contract to the Kansas Water Office from one of the federal reservoirs. After, given that the trips those, those thresholds of volume and distance, that triggers the Water Transfer Act, which is a very severe vetting of the, of the project to look at whether, in the end, the benefits to the state outweigh the, the, the costs of, not, uh, of, of that transfer, and essentially whether the benefits that accrue are greater than what the opportunity costs are if that water uh, was removed and not left in the, in the basin of origin. 
but it also requires a, a sponsor, a, a applicant or proponent to go through a rigorous process to demonstrate conservation, sustainability. They've looked at all alternative water supplies. They've maintained the water quality of their existing water supplies. They've cleaned up uh, a, a contaminated water supplies that they can subsequently use for water. Basically, the water transfer is an act of last resort. So from a policy perspective, um, and, and com coming out of the, the vision deliberations in, in 2017, 2018, uh, the recommendation held firm. And so, so it's now contained within the vision that is continually being shepherded by the Kansas Water Office. So in place now, from the policy perspective, there are numerous safeguards to uh, address what the legislature was concerned with back in 1994. The Water Transfer Act itself is a rigorous process to uh, not uh, overly burden the basins of origin where these waters might arise, and that there again is a basically a subsequent uh, ground truthing that all other means of providing water supply for the, for the uh, project sponsor is in place. Having subsequently get through that, if this bill were to become law, then having basically gone through that process and, and vetted as being in the in the uh, best interest of the state to proceed for it, then it opens up the door for the SR, the Drinking Water SRF, to become a one of the financing mechanisms to support uh, the implementation of that of that transfer and the infrastructure associated with it. But it's a loan it will have to be repaid back. So there is no giveaway attached to this. Um, and again, it doesn't impact any of the, the uh, state uh, general fund or, or uh, anything else. It basically just draws upon the available resources within the, the drinking water SRF fund. Um, and that in and of itself is protected because it is uh, overseen through department administration and then de uh, development finance authority. So there are fiduciary uh, safeguards in place not to overextend the use of those funds uh, to uh, a, a large, large uh, uh, projects and, and associated loans there that would subsequently jeopardize its ability to continue to work toward uh, supporting and financing other drinking water uh, infrastructure in, in the years after uh, that, that loan is in, put in place. And then finally, there are federal uh, conditions and expectations on the SRF. For example, the SRF can't be used to buy water rights. Uh, and uh, finally, I will just say that the SRF really is not a uh, eco-devo uh, fund. It is, in fact, really a uh, regulatory compliance uh, fund that's utilized by the municipalities to stay on the right side of the Safe Drinking Water Act. So, as an agency, we're neutral. As a matter of policy, there are a lot of uh, arguments to be said that this bill uh, is, 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 represents good policy that reflects uh, the uh, planning and uh, implementation and meeting of future municipal and pub other public water supply water needs uh, in the future. So with that, I'll be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you very much. I might say that if you're saying that, that in the future, this the project could be used as a model for water transfer usage or? What it would do, I mean, a given project would have to go through the entire, first off, it would have to acquire either water rights or uh, go through a, get a contract from the water office for a marketing contract. Those events in themselves go through a severe vetting to make sure that the, it's in, they represent the public, the public interest. Then it goes into the Water Transfer Act, where the, uh, the chief engineer, as, as chairperson of the uh, transfer panel, convenes uh, up the three-person panel representing himself uh, and DWR, the director of the Kansas Water Office, and the secretary of uh, KDHE or subsequent or uh, uh, the uh, uh, director of the Division of Environment at that. That three-person panel basically uh, hires a, a hearing officer to conduct the analysis and hearing of, of, of the, uh, the project and the, and the intended uh, uh, transfer and vetting it through all the requirements that are contained within the statutes under 82A, 1502, and 03 that uh, look at all those things in terms of uh, the, subsequent, the current use of the water, intended and anticipated future use, 
presence of conservation practices and how well they've been effective, looking at alternative water supplies that might be available, the cleanup of other, other uh, water supplies, et cetera. Uh, but basically goes through all that process. Having run that gauntlet, if the project makes it through and is approved as a water transfer, this bill, if it were passed, would basically say, okay, now you can engage KDHE to talk about if you can utilize, get an SRF loan to uh, finance part of, part of the project. Okay, uh, just another question. How long does that process take to do, run through that? Well, uh, if you ask Hayes, too long. But uh, it, it, it takes years. Uh, and uh, just by these, uh, anytime you talk about water, no matter what, uh, it triggers a visceral response of people that say, you're not taking our water. Oh, and even though there might be a, a noble uh, intention of where that water, uh, could, how it could be used. The process is, uh, is pretty extended. Right now, we, uh, at least in the case of the Hayes one, we're just getting through uh, reconciling uh, the change orders with uh, the water rights that Hayes has acquired there. We haven't triggered anything yet with the Water Transfer Act. Uh, and we're waiting the call from the chief engineer to basically convene the panel to begin that process. But it is an, a, a long extended process. Notwithstanding, that's just through the, the protocols of the Administrative Procedures Act, notwithstanding any other legal challenges and so forth there. So it's a elongated process. This bill basically represents, just sits in waiting for the outcome of that, uh, those procedures to come forth. Thank you very much for that information. That was really important, I thought. Any other questions? Senator Reichman. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your presentation. You, it's quite a process to get where they got here, and you went through some of the hoops and so on and so forth. It's very, it wasn't your written, but, but as you was talking about it. So this short bill that we have here will not take, cut out any of those process if someone else wanted to do a water transfer. I, I, so I'm really asking, are you, are you fine where the bill is written? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, we are. I mean, again, it's a matter of legislative prerogative, whether you want to make that the new policy regarding how the SRF engages water transfers. But as it's written, we can handle it. It imposes no physical impact to KDHE and we have sufficient safeguards within the SRF so that uh, we don't believe that it uh, uh, creates a undue burden on, on the uh, use of that loan fund uh, by the project or for any other projects that might want to tap into it. The bill, uh, we can easily work within the, the uh, construct of, of this legislation. Senator Fagg. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a couple questions. Thank you, Tom, for your presentation. Uh, last loan that you've made out of that, what kind of, when they say low interest loans, what was the rate and how long was it? You know, a 30 year deal or what? It's typically, uh, right now, the interest has still been, it's been hovering this way for uh, a couple of years now, 1.3%. Okay. Um, it's adjusted uh, based on the, uh, the the bond buyers 20 index over the last three months or so, the average there, and then it takes a percentage of that. Typically the loans are 20 year loans, but on drinking water, uh, past legislation in the last few years has allowed for some situations where that could be extended out to, to 30 years and in uh, dire situations for disadvantaged communities out to 40 years. But more typically it's been a 20 year loan. That's a fixed rate. That is fixed. Okay. Let's say this bill passes, Tom, and the application's made. That federal grant money caught my ear. Uh, do you, does that have to be part of the application? Let's say they go through and get the loan. Feds come out and say, hey, we got this grant. Does that mean they missed that opportunity, in your opinion? Not if they, a grant, no. I mean, but we'll, we're waiting to hear uh, what the guidelines and rules are regarding all this uh, federal largesse that's coming down from the infrastructure. Sometimes you can make an application and uh, you can be too early at it and 
not grandfathered kind of thing. That's I'll I'm... say this. In our process, uh, early is good. You get the project into what we call the uh, intended use plan, and that gets you in the, the door right away to weigh in some of these things. It's You're at a greater disadvantage if you're trying to play catch up after the, the money's arrived. Okay. And my final question is, this is a loan. So you got the contract parties involved, and let's say some... Um, uh, maybe one of the communities that's responsible for this loses a big industry and they can't afford to pay. Uh, what happens in that case? Does the state have any indirect obligation to that? Or if that community can't pay, what happens in that scenario? First of all, it's never happened. Uh, uh, second, and this gets to the uh, fiduciary uh, oversight of that, we put up loans for projects that have a high, extremely high probability of us receiving it. Even through the, the, the pandemic, when the issue, the scenario you described was starting to uh, arise there, we didn't see it. We can make accommodations to uh, uh, put uh, some payments in uh, abeyance and hold them off until they have recovery there. But uh, generally, uh, the cities know their own interest and, and, and understand what their obligations are. Uh, it would be a, a unique, dire situation that we would have to work with the, uh, the uh, uh, loan holder to, to get through. We've never experienced that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? Senator Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate your comments, and I've looked up um, the... 82A 1502 approval of transfers. So that makes me feel more comfortable about um, those requirements. So I'm trying, did I misunderstand when um, the city manager for Hayes was reporting that, I think he said the lawyer um, said you didn't have to follow this or follow sustainability? What was that comment or if you could help me with that? Yes, Senator. Uh, that actually had to do with the, um, the chief engineer's um, request that we agree to sustainable usage of the property uh, with our water rights. Um, so that was separate from the Transfer Act itself. Um, um, in, in, in Kansas, um, so when you convert one water right from one use to another, um, there is a regulatory process that's followed. And there is a formula that's used, and the formula is, is set up by county. Um, and so typically um, you follow the formula, uh, you input the numbers, a number gets put out and that's your number. So if we were moving this water to say Kinsley, um, that would be it because the water transfer act wouldn't be kicked in, we would get a number. Um, and so the chief engineer, knowing that we had to navigate the water transfer act, knowing there was going to be this statewide uh, means test, um, this statewide benefit test, asked us to commit to sustainable usage so that was the part where the, the, the attorney said that um, you, don't, you don't have to do that. There's no regulatory requirement um, because by regulation, we don't have to do that. But um, we agreed to because we know we had to, to navigate the transfer process. And, and we had to uh, make sure that we checked every box in the transfer process to make sure we are holding the state harmless and creating a benefit. So although it wasn't a requirement that the chief engineer could impose legally, the Transfer Act does make those same kind of requirements. Um, well, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here. The chief engineer thought he had the ability to require us to, um, to adhere to sustainable yield based off of some specific regulations. Um, our attorney didn't think he did, so that would be a legal battle we would have to fight. Um, but, but yes, um, part of the, one of the components of the Water Transfer Act is you're not depleting the local source of supply. Um, and, and so um, even if we had a right to utilize our water in an unsustainable manner that could deplete the aquifer, um, that might not allow us to navigate the transfer process if one of the components is, you know, not depleting the local source of supply. So, again, that's one of the reasons why we agreed to, to use it sustainably. We do not want to be any part of the, the, the local supply going down. Thank you for the explanation, and thank you for your agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee, any other questions? 
Any other questions at all? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Thank Stop. you. <clears throat> Committee, I, uh, I was, um, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill, uh, what we got? 358, <laughs> I had cross number. We were going to close the hearing on Senate Bill 358. I was going to ask if, um, seeing that a lot of the factual information and there are no opponents, could you, would you entertain a motion? Could we to pass this out so we can get the process moving or you need more time to think about it? Just some feedback. <laughs> Senator Dahl. I move that we pass this bill out. I'll second. Okay, there's been a motion and a second to pass the bill out favorably. Any discussion? Senator Francisco. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just hoping to talk to um, some representatives from the Water Office after the discussion about um, the ability, if it existed or not, to require sustainability. I think you can do that, and then we'll just we can pass it out. We can hold it off until you're satisfied with what questions you have. Are you going to? Or do you have a problem with with moving the bill forward? Well, I don't. I mean, I wouldn't want to have this discussion on the floor, um, and I just wanted to have that sort of assurance from the water office. I I would be um, happy to um, see it uh, voted on tomorrow. We're going to be voting on another bill, if that. Right. So we're meeting tomorrow if the rest of the committee would give me that time to ask those questions. We could do that. So with the motion and the second, permission. Okay, well, committee, that's what we'll do then. We'll postpone the advancement of the bill until we convene, convene tomorrow. And we'll do that the first thing. Okay, all right. Committee, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll... Adjourn and see you tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you very much.